is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, welcome everyone coming in. We are going to get started here right on time. So if you need to do anything, we've got about six minutes. So if you need to get a cup of coffee or use the restroom, um, all microphones and cameras are going to be muted and turned off when you enter the room. Just make sure that if you do turn it on, that you do make sure that you turn it off so that we can give our undivided attention. And then we will begin at 12.30. Okay, we have a few more people popping in here. I just want to let everyone know we're planning on starting at exactly 1230. Just please make sure that your microphones and cameras are turned off. And we are keeping an eye on the clock as people come in and it should be just a few more minutes.
right, everybody, it's 1230. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So I just want to introduce myself. My name is Jamie Montgomery. I am now the project coordinator for Oregon Pacific Area Health Education Center. We're a hosted agency of Samaritan Lebanon Community Hospital. And today I'm going to be facilitating and moderating the CME with Dr. Bascom. And I just want to go over a couple housekeeping uh, tips here with you for today's CME. So first and foremost, um, all microphones are muted. Um, there is the slide deck in the handouts panel for everyone if you would like to download that. Um, questions will be answered at the end of the CME. There is a questions area that is on your um, desktop that is going to be available to you should you like to ask a question. Um, the recording will be posted at www.opahec.org forward slash webinar stash one, as well as to our YouTube channel. Um, if you have any questions that you would like asked um, regarding the CME today, you can email those questions to myself at jmontgummer at simhealth.org, and those will be directed to Dr. Bascom, and we will get those answered for you. Today's activity code for you to be able to get your certification for CME is listed here. It's the 07PANG. If you enter that code into the event for eads.com, you'll be able to download your certificate for your participation today. So I just want to go over a disclosure that Dr. Bascom and the planners of this activity have no relevant financial relationships to disclose with ineligible companies whose primary business is producing marketing, selling, reselling, or distributing healthcare products used by or on patients. All right, and I am going to go ahead at this point and I am going to turn it over to Dr. Bascom and we appreciate you guys all being here today. All right. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today um, for our third and final part in the series um, of, of chronic pain from a biopsychosocial spiritual treatment modality. I am so grateful for everybody that's shown up and for, for questions. Um, I will do my best um, to answer those. Um, and, and sometimes I don't always have the answers on, on the top of my head and, and I will endeavor to look those up um, if that should happen where I don't have an answer. But I just wanna thank you all so much for your commitment um, to helping people who are dealing with chronic pain or maybe it's you know some of your patients or clients, but maybe it's some of your family members. And so I just greatly appreciate um, the interest and and want to spread knowledge about this. So today, let's go ahead and get started with some of the treatment aspects of patients um, who are dealing with chronic pain. So again, no conflicts of interest to report. What we're gonna look at today, a brief agenda, um, we're just gonna briefly look at pharmacological and non-pharmacological options for treatment. Um, and so that would be including discussing some of those options of complementary and alternative medicine. Um, we're also gonna talk about, as I said, um, a little bit about opioids, um, a little bit about um, benzodiazepines and psychopharmacological interventions as well for chronic pain. Um, but we're going to really also spend a bulk of the time discussing how those third and fourth wave psychotherapies um, can really be used um, in the treatment of, of chronic pain. Um, and then we will also discuss kind of what enhances um, patient and provider factors in successful treatment of chronic pain. You know, what helps create um, the most successful relationships um, and also really um, promote self-efficacy for the patient. So first, this is just a, a, an overall kind of broad list, certainly not uh, exhaustive um, of all of the options of taking care of um, chronic pain, different modalities, different types of approaches um, that include traditional, traditional and complementary approaches. 
So again, you see some of our, you know, commonly, um, you know, used uh, treatments, opioids, NSAIDs, um, our psychopharmacology. Um, and so some of the ones that I've underlined are going to be ones that I go into a little bit more detail today, um, like acupuncture and medical cannabis, um, as well as virtual reality. Um, and I have um, actually some experience um, in a previous position working with um, doing evaluations with spine spinal cord stimulators. Um, and so if anybody has any questions, I'm not going to really go into depth about that, but if anybody has any questions about what that, you know, evaluation process would look like or the psychological component um, that might be involved in, in those evaluations, I'm happy to share more information about that. So let's just talk a little bit. So opioids is kind of the hot button issue and has been, I think, for a while, um, you know, within the U.S. Um, and, and certainly globally as well. But, um, you know, the U.S., I, I think, you know, this is a widely known statistic, even though we um, are about 5% of the world population, yet we use about 80% of the prescribed global prescriptions of opioids. Um, and that is according to Nelson, who has an amazing book um, called The United States of Opioids, which I highly recommend. Um, and so if we break that down, that looks like about 10 million people um, are on long-term opioid therapy. And the issue with that, you know, outside of, of course, so, you know, our, our statistics of overdoses and death between 2000 and 2025, potentially estimating a million U.S. deaths, from opioid overdose. Um, outside of death, it, it certainly also affects a number of our body systems, including respiratory systems. So a depression of that system, um, a difficulty with breathing. Um, and I'll loop back around to that a little bit later. Because if you also remember um, from our previous discussion about John Sarno and some of his um, reflections on um, what he his theories on chronic pain and one having to do with the lack of oxygen to our muscles and to our body systems. Um, so that could also be impactful in um, generating centralization and, and continued issues with chronic pain complications. Um, gastrointestinal, so it slows down motility of the intestines, um, dealing with constipation, um, potentially even, um, you know, blockages or obstructions, which could be um, fatal um, if, if not taken care of, uh, musculoskeletal and cardiovascular issues, um, immune system functioning, endocrine systems, um, different, so central nervous system, um, again, you know, so many uh, of our systems are impacted by the opioid use. So we want to also be able to talk to our um, patients about that. You know, here might be some of the experiences, you know, to, you know, your, your GI system. Here might be some of the experiences to, you know, your respiratory system um, and maybe kind of explain what, what that would look like if they have any other comorbid illnesses too, how that might potentially complicate them. Like, for example, if, if, you know, somebody has issues with pulmonary embolisms, but they also have severe chronic pain, um, how do you manage that? You know, making sure that their respiratory system is also taken care of. This is an FYI. The other thing I want to highlight is that um, there are almost seven to 10,000 death, uh, deaths per year um, based on NSAIDs. Um, so I don't think that we really include that enough in the conversation um, when we're talking about, you know, pharmacological treatment of chronic pain, um, that we also need to be really aware aware um, of our NSAIDs. Um, also, again, anybody that has gastrointestinal issues or, you know, um, other, other potential illnesses, like you have to be incredibly aware of the impact that those um, meds might have on the intestinal system. Like, for example, individuals that have GI issues or inflammatory bowel disease um, want to stay away from, you know, your ibuprofen and your aspirins because that can actually create um, bleeding and ulcers ulcers and thinning of the lining of those intestines. So, you know, again, you want to be just really aware of what are the side effects of some of these meds. 
just some global statistics on opioid availability um, to kind of give you a little bit of a, a, of a scope and context. So they looked at um, different countries and availability, um, uh, you know, per palliative care patient um, of opioids that existed within the country. And so you can see that there's a pretty significant disparity. So Nigeria has enough opioid availability. And so they're measuring that again in that, that morphine equivalent um, opioids. Nigeria has enough to meet only 0.2% of palliative care needs per patient. Mexico has enough to meet 36% of palliative care needs per patient. Canada has enough to meet 3,090% of palliative care needs per patient. So you can just see within those three countries, um, how much of a disparity there is um, in, in availability. Um, some of our countries, our developing countries right now, have extremely limited access um, to opioids. Um, and, you know, that's also a, a part of the picture that we need to continue to talk about. Um, you know, how are they managing pain without opioids? Um, you know, what is their quality of life? Um, what can we learn from that? Um, so, uh, our opioid use in the U.S. Um, peaked uh, in about 2012 um, in sort of, a, if we look at data from CDC and um, the WHO, and uh, so we look at, we, we're at about 81.3 prescriptions per 100 persons in 2012. And fortunately, we've been able to improve that pretty significantly. Um, where you know, reassessed in 2018, we were back down to 51.4 prescriptions per 100 persons. Um, so that looks like 255 million total opioid prescriptions down to 168 million. However, there are some statistics that suggest that about a third of individuals who are experiencing chronic pain in the U.S don't have access to adequate amounts of opioids and adequate amounts of prescriptions. Um, so we still have um, a little bit of a, of a dual problem, right? We have the opioid pandemic on the one hand where we are seeing the abuse uh, and the misuse. Um, and then we absolutely are, are seeing another pandemic um, where it's the pendulum is swung the other way and, and some of the individuals that genuinely need it are maybe not getting it. So it's important to look at our statistics. Just if we look at global use, um, in particular, there's some really great data looking at um, kind of over the last 20 years um, with the uh, G7 countries, so Germany, US, Canada, France, Italy, Japan, um, looking at use of opioids over the course of the last 20 years. Um, we've seen some significant changes, so increases in Spain, Portugal, Netherlands, Switzerland, Poland, Norway, so those aren't a part of the G7. Um, but other studies have also been able to include um, many other countries so that we can start to track this data. Um, we have seen a decrease for Germany, who was actually the number one consumer of opioids in 2009, decreases for the US and Canada. So um, we're, we're, you know, the more we can track these trends, um, again, the more we can learn, you know, what's effective and what's not effective in helping mitigate uh, the opioid. Uh, epidemic. So just a list of, of opioids, a lot of these probably look familiar to you. Again, not an exhaustive list, um, but just to kind of get a few of those on your radar. And the thing that I want to highlight about opioids um, and opioid use, um, so there was a question um, after the first lecture um, where I had mentioned endogenous opioids or endogenous um, yeah, uh, opioids essentially receptors. Um, and there was a question about whether or not that was the same as, as the opioid receptors. And so we essentially, we have endogenous and exogenous opioid receptors in our body. And so the endogenous opioid receptors are the things that our body releases after we get like an injury or a nociceptive stimuli to our peripheral system, right? And so we have three different types of those. So those are endorphins, dimorphins, and encephalins. And so our body can release those to alleviate some of our body's, uh, you know, 
pain levels, some of our body's response to pain. However, you know, we have a cap on it's our body's ability to do that, to help our pain. Those only go so far. And so that's where we need some of those synthetic opioids, those ex exogenous opioids um, to help us mitigate that pain. And so our body has three main types of opioid receptors, mu, delta, and kappa, which are, again, you know, in different parts of the body, you know, our organs, our brain, our GI system, you know, all of our body systems have different amounts of these receptors. And so different opioids bind to different receptors. Um, you know, it's not as straightforward as this medicine is going to be effective for this person because we don't know what that actually looks like for them. We don't know, you know, their genetic makeup, their, you know, again, you know, females versus males tend to have different amounts of receptors, um, mu receptors, for example, in the periaqueductal gray. Um, many people don't know that men have two times the amount of receptors, um, the mu receptors that women do. And so we need two times the amount of morphine, you know, some studies are showing to reach the same analgesic effect. Um, so just really interesting, um, as well with pentazazine or Talwin, I think I mentioned before, um, redheaded women, if they have a certain, um, you know, allele combination and genetic combination, they will receive the most analgesic effects um, from pentazazine um, over redheaded men and any other, um, you know, colored hair individuals. Um, so just again, like things that we're learning that one would go, gosh, I, I would not have put that together or I never would have considered um, the impact uh, on, on, um, you know, the body or, or pain. Um, it also depends on whether these are agonists or antagonists, right, to our receptors. So agonists, whether they're going to propel and create more of that or antagonists, whether they might prevent or uh, impede that. So again, this is, I'm not the MD, I'm not the medical doctor. I realize that um, I have a lot more to learn. And if any of that sounded really confusing or did not sound straightforward, um, please let me know because I can absolutely work on explaining that um, I'm not always as articulate as I want to be with, with some of the medication pieces. So again, um, Nelson in the United States of Opioids also suggested kind of just, uh, you know, a little bit of, of a saying to be able to help us kind of stay on track in the medical field or anywhere, you know. So looking at O, opioids, public health outreach and education to improve prevention and early intervention, improve physician practices, innovation to improve therapeutics and care, looking at overdose interventions, expanding interdiction efforts to stop illegal sources of opioids, using data and analytics to address health risks and health trends, strengthening access to addiction treatment and recovery programs. Um, so, you know, this could be something that could, you could distribute to um, anybody in your clinic, um, people who might be struggling with um, how to manage, you know, the opioid prescri prescribing or um, trends within their city or, um, you know, clinics. Like I said, um, you know, I think it's hard that we don't have a standardized, a completely standardized um, set of rules for every clinic in every state. Um, so it might help um, if you're looking for a little bit of direction um, and some general guidelines. Some psychopharmacological treatment uh, in chronic pain. So again, these may look pretty familiar to you. We've got our SSRIs, our SNRIs, our MAOIs, our tricyclics and TCAs, our NDRIs. Um, and so we're not going to go into the specific use of all of these. Um, but what I will say is that um, tricyclics have been superior to SSRIs in a number of studies that have been done, particularly with IBS and back pain, prevention for headaches, 
fibromyalgia and sleep issues. Um, we definitely have noticed, you know, again, the SSRIs, SNRIs, and tricyclics have seemed to be the most effective. Um, GABA is a really important, um, you know, component of chronic pain. And so anything that's going to affect the body's GABA, uh, which is an agonist, um, that's going to significantly impact pain levels. So that's why, you know, gabapentin or pregabalin, which are some of our anti-convulsants or anti-epileptics, why that can have a significant impact on pain but they're also um, very relevant in terms of mood regulation as well. So some of the sedatives that we would see with chronic pain, so there's also a lot of discussion about um, the use of benzodiazepines with opioids. Um, this is a very dangerous combination um, as the opioids also repress the respiratory system. Um, benzodiazepines also do this. Um, it's another depressant as well. Um, and so it, it can be fatal um, if combined in too high of dosages. Uh, benzodiazepines are really a temporary um, medication, very short-term use is recommended um, because it's highly addictive. Opioids are highly addictive and so are benzodiazepines um, because, again, they work not only to mitigate some of those pain mechanisms, but also the anxiety, the fear, um, you know, some of the, the depression even, you know, that's associated with pain. So muscle relaxers are also commonly used. Um, Again, we want to be really careful with this because combined with opioids, you know, we could have individuals that are, again, experiencing extreme drowsiness, uh, fatigue, um, issues with mobility or falling. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we let them know because there are, are some muscle relaxers that cause more fatigue than others. Some are kind of more for daytime versus nighttime. So, again, we want to make sure that we know what our, our patient's lifestyle looks like and that if they're going to work, Tizanidine is probably not the the medic, you know, the muscle relaxer for them because that's going to cause pretty significant drowsiness. Um, gabapentin and Lyrica, again, you know, what is somebody also on? In are they on an SSRI, an SNRI? You know, we want to make sure that we're not, you know, um, having, you know, medication contradictions or contraindications. Um, so just really talking with your medical provider and even potentially going to a, a psychiatrist. I know that um, for a lot of individuals, that is like a dirty word to hear psychiatrist when you're talking with um, people in the chronic pain population. You know, but what you can again share is that your entire condition is bio, psycho, social, spiritual. If your biochemistry is off, including some of these neurotransmitters, you know, that are involved in mood regulation, gosh, it makes sense for us to treat it. And let's go to the doctor that knows how to treat that. Um, so just again, really trying to normalize, um, you know, some of these providers that could help with different domains of dealing with chronic pain. Ooh, so medical cannabis is um, something that has, I think, also been talked about quite a bit um, more recently, certainly within legislation in the U.S. Um, and whether states are willing to legalize this, whether we're willing to legalize um, medical cannabis um, or cannabis at a federal um, and national level as well. Um, because the U.S. is um, technically um, seen cannabis as a schedule one um, drug, uh, we have not done quite a bit of research um, looking at its potential benefits or side effects. So we're, we're a little bit behind in looking at that. Um, but the two major cannabinoids that are studied are the Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, and cannabidiol, CBD. Um, I think those have been pretty well, you know, commonly talked about. So THC has more of the psychoactive properties, um, whereas the CBD has a little bit more of the anti-inflammatory um, properties and no psychoactive properties. So CBD is, is technically sold in, you know, pretty uh, most places. Um, there's not a regulation on that. 
Um, so we have CB1 and CB2. We have THC um, activates cannabinoid receptors type 1 and 2. So where these, again, these receptors are in our body, they're concentrated in a little bit of different places. So like, for example, CB2 is a little bit more, um, more receptors within the immune system and the gastrointestinal system. Um, so again, kind of talking with somebody that might be well versed in, you know, what type of strain um, you're purchasing with THC and CBD, um, how that might um, work for your body, what your needs are, whatever illnesses you might have. Um, because we have, like I said, cannabinoid receptors in a variety of tissues throughout the body from neurons in the frontal cortex to gastrointestinal tract and immune cells. Um, we have also seen um, something that is called the entourage effect, um, where for a number of people, the combination of THC and CBD creates a synergistic effect. Um, and for, you know, for some people, it creates a little bit more of an effect and, and they feel the response a little bit stronger or the impact a little bit stronger. And so for some people, that's the best balance. But again, it's trial and error. And that's one of the reasons why medical professionals still feel really uncomfortable um, with medical cannabis, because there is really no way to regulate and manage dosage effect and, um, you know, to, to really make sure that what people are getting is, you know, um, safe and, and, you know, regulated. And so we still have quite a long way to go. Um, however, the research is promising that um, there have been a lot of benefits in reducing opioid usage um, for individuals experiencing chronic pain. So I did my residency and internship in Pennsylvania, um, where our opioid epidemic was was severe. Um, and I was working with individuals that were considered super utilizers of the medical system. So individuals with profound chronic pain and medical issues on significantly high doses, polysubs, you know, polysubstance of benzos, opioids, antidepressants, um, you know, it's just so many medications where, um, I mean, I had patients at one point falling asleep in session because they were um, using so much medication and being able to get these individuals off of opioids using medical cannabis. Um, Pennsylvania had just legalized the use of medical cannabis um, we saw some tremendous effects. So I know that's just anecdotal um, from my clinical experience, but um, I genuinely had one, one individual tell me, yeah, this has given me my life back. And, um, you know, he was one of the ones that had been falling asleep uh, in our sessions. And, and it was just amazing to be able to see um, that he could go out with his family again, and he could move around a little bit easier. Um, and then he had hope. So, um, again, like I said, a lack of precise dose treatments um, are a major deterrent for providers, which is understandable. Uh, we have a lot more to learn about this. I realize that, you know, as a provider, you want to make sure uh, that you are, that you're giving the best possible advice and the safest treatments to your patients. And so it makes sense that if this is not yet standardized and regulated, there's a bit of hesitation. Um, however, we have seen benefits um, with a number of conditions. Um, so again, CRPS, you know, which is that um, the allodynia, the major central sensitization where people have profound chronic pain um, that may not really be responding to anything else. Um, and medical cannabis is an option. Um, multiple sclerosis, cervical disc disease. Um, so we've obviously, I think, heard about, you know, um, epilepsy and Parkinson's and the use of medical cannabis for a number of those disorders, which has been pretty profound um, and remarkable to see. So case by case basis, of course, um, this is going to be different. And some people might experience a significant amount of benefit um, and others may report none at all. Uh, and so that, 
comes back to as well, biopsychosocial. You know, what is their genetic makeup? What have they been told about cannabis? How have they been taught to think about it? Um, is there a way that they can think about it as medicine or is it just dope to them and there's just no way they could see it as medicine? Um, so again, you know, a number of things um, will even impact level of comfort um, and patient use and willingness to try this. So. Um, but 18 states have legalized recreational and medical marijuana use. Only 36 of the 50 states allow for some form of medical marijuana, but it's it's changing. Um, again, you know, where I think the push for new legislation is happening all the time, and I'm I'm sure that I'm behind um, even in some of these statistics. So I can try to update that as well if people have um, additional questions about that. But one of the other, you know, promising movements as well is looking at anti-discrimination um, employee protection. So for example, if individuals are using medical cannabis as actual medicine, and they are, um, you know, is it fair to discriminate against them, you know, in this, you know, when we wouldn't potentially do that if they were taking tramadol or if they were taking, you know, a prescribed medication that does have a, you know, a, a strong dosage effect and empirical research and all that. Um, but it is medication for a lot of employees. And so that has created issues with, with people losing jobs, with people being fired, um, but we're seeing a decriminalization of that. Certainly, um, it depends on what you do um, for your job um, and what type of cannabis you're using. If you're using the THC and it's more psychoactive and, and you need to be really alert and focused and concentrated at your work, that that's probably not going to work out. Um, that's probably not going to be okay by the company. Um, you know, so we're in the beginning stages of figuring this out, but I do think that companies are starting to recognize that more and more employees are using this as, as viable options for not only chronic pain use, but again, mental health issues too, anxiety, depression. So um, Cannabis for Chronic Pain is a great book by Dr. Rav Ivekar. So just a little blurb. Um, he said, from my perspective as a physician and scientist, there is not and has never been a pharmaceutical drug that possesses its breadth of therapeutic properties. Um, he had shingles incredibly severely, um, debilitatingly so, and ended up turning to cannabis um, to manage his chronic pain um, and was able to find uh, pretty significant success. So um, maybe it, it is one of the things where it takes a personal experience for some people to be able to shift the mindset or perspective on, on its use or effectiveness. Um, but I can, you know, for a lot of people, it has been a success option. <clears throat> so now looking at some of the complementary and alternative medicine approaches. So what do we mean when we say complementary and alternative medicine? So looking at whole medical systems and traditional medicine, including traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, European, um, Indian, Arabian, um, any kind of homeopathy um, that we can bring in, mind-body intervention. So of course we've heard of yoga, Tai Chi, meditation, relaxation. Um, I'm gonna show you some of the DBT and emotional freedom technique and the EMDR techniques as well that incorporate mind-body interventions as well as art and music therapy, dance and biofeedback. So we are learning a lot about um, the vagus nerve and also its impact in regulating chronic pain, regulating mood, regulating um, just many body systems. Um, and so a lot of these mind-body interventions also stimulate that vagus nerve in the body. And we really wanna have that you know, activated because that is going to improve our functioning, our circulation, um, you know, and a lot of people don't realize that there are many easy ways to stimulate that. Um, for example, if you are singing, you are regulating your breath um, you are remembering words to a song, so you're having to be in your frontal cortex and you're not in your limbic system. Um, so we, we have data that shows that even just the act of singing activates your parasympathetic nervous system um, and activates that vagus nerve for you. 
Um, so just just little ways of being able to help yourself that don't take hours out of your day. Um, we look at manipulative or body-based methods, so um, chiropractors and osteopathic manipulation. Um, so again, chiropractors, you want to make sure that you feel safe and comfortable, um, that you meet with this, you know, um, provider and you really feel like they have um, a firm scope and knowledge of your specific individual experience. Um, I recommend, you know, getting, you know, second, third, fourth opinions for people if they don't necessarily feel um, like, like they feel safe or they feel, um, you know, really sure that this treatment is right for them. Um, massage um, is a is a very very effective um, tool to manage chronic pain. Uh, however, you know, let's be real, like it is expensive, and it's um, you know one thing that is a deterrent for people to be able to use some of these um, complementary and alternative um, you know medicine approaches is the financial piece. Um, and so, you know, we, we do need to have kind of a, a, a discussion about how can we also, um, for those that are, that are lower socioeconomic status, how can we also give them tools and options that may not be, you know, cost intensive. We also want to look at natural products and biologically based therapies. Um, nutritional interventions and dietary supplements. Uh, I, I talked to a lot of people, you know, about just those. You know, so we, in the first lecture, we talked about nutrition. We talked about the microbiome and how important that is. The enteric nervous system is in helping regulate the entire body and chronic pain. Um, I recognize that it's also expensive to have a nutritional diet at times. Um, it doesn't mean you have to eat everything organic um, to, to have a, you know, adequate nutrition, um, but just really looking at nutritionally dense foods to try to make the most uh, of what you eat. So prevalence of use of acupuncture, medicinal herbs, and other um, complementary and alternative medication approaches ranges it's a pretty broad range, 28 to 90 percent. Um, however, the results are pretty promising in the chronic pain populations. Um, so there is stigma and controversy um, surrounding some of our, our you know, CAM uses. Um, so again, Western medicine has been very convinced that the biomedical approach has been the most effective and you know safest way to treat chronic pain um, or or many any conditions. Um, however, we are seeing a shift. We are seeing change because we have more chronic illnesses than we've ever seen. We have more, more comorbid illnesses than we've ever seen. We're very clearly seeing that Western medicine has not been the panacea, has not been the cure that all of us have maybe wanted it to be. Um, so we have seen better health outcomes and we have actually seen lower costs um, than usual care alone for a variety of chronic health conditions. So when I talk about those, the individuals who are super utilizers, when we introduced, you know, more of these, you know, massage or acupuncture or even, you know, the psychotherapies that I'm going to talk about later, you know, we found that that minimized their need to go to the emergency room, that minimized their need, you know, for procedures or tests or scans, that, um, that the economic burden of their illnesses was mitigated um, by the use of, of these complementary and alternative um, medication approaches. So pediatrics um, with uh, CAM, so 61% in a study with Grunewald in 2017, 61% of parents um, of children with chronic pain reported um, that CAM use led to improved overall health. Uh, reportedly 55% reduced stress levels, 42% reported better sleep, 39% uh, reported feeling better emotionally, 
83% of the participants um, using CAM improved overall general wellness and disease prevention. Um, and so we come to some of the common reasons that the parents, you know, su supported using some of these therapies. Um, some you know, perceived as natural, right? Not wanting to put their children on prescription medication when they're very young, um, you know, preferring a more a holistic approach, um, treating more of the cause and not just the symptoms. Uh, so we'll see even with some of these mind-body psychotherapy approaches, um, we're not just looking at the symptoms, we're really looking at what has been so deeply kind of rooted within the body that is, you know, could be emotional in nature, could be traumatic in nature, um, could also be biological in nature, you know, what or what is the cause, not just the symptom. So focuses on the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. 35% um, of the parents endorsed that as a reason why they used CAM. Um, and then treatment was part of their upbringing. So they felt comfortable with it because that was what they were, were taught was appropriate and helpful. Uh, we can't underestimate the impact of how, how these um, treatments were presented to people when they were young and with their family and their peers. Um, that has a significant influence on whether or not they feel like it would be effective or not. So among children with pain factors most associated with complementary and alternative medicine use, so females um, had higher use of CAM, um, individuals with higher incomes um, had more use of CAM, higher parental education levels were all significantly associated with increased use um, of complementary alternative medicine. Um, Caucasian individuals with chronic pain had a higher use of CAM um, versus Hispanic and African-American um, counterparts. Um, so child age was not associated. Um, so, you know, again, just looking at factors that would help increase the use of these techniques or where we're at least seeing trends of um, those, you know, more willing to engage in this or learn about it or, um, you know, might be more open to it. Um, among clinical characteristics, sleep disturbances, stress, depression, and fatigue not associated with increased use of CAM, which is interesting, but having four or more comorbid conditions was strongly associated with CAM use. So one might hypothesize that at that juncture, it's become you know, so intense and severe with, with four different comorbid conditions that, um, that the doctors are baffled, parents are baffled, you know, and have exhausted other opportunities or treatments or you know, ways of treating this and that they really are desperate. And you know, this is kind of the final thing, you know, whereas we hope that people start to use this as more of a, a first line approach instead of a, a, a last defense. Um, region also affects use of CAM. So individuals in southern U.S. have a much lower, uh, much lower rates of use than other re other regions. Again, that can be because of you know cultural traditions and just willingness to accept Eastern medicine and practices. It could be access. It could be, you know, maybe they just don't have um, these resources or facilities or providers. Um, so we might just, you know, again, look at these, look at these trends, look at what's going on um, and, and see where the gaps are. Briefly to talk about acupuncture. I think a lot of us have heard of acupuncture. Um, it, there's a lot of evidence that again supports its regulation of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system that vagus nerve regulation acupuncture is extremely effective with that so it helps um, neurotransmitters and neuromodulators it helps regulate endorphins neurohumoral factors other chemical mediators um, like i said i'm not going to go super in depth in this um because you know, you can look up, you know, acupuncture if that's really interesting to you. Um, but we have, like I've said, we've seen a lot of improvement for people who can afford this treatment um, and who feel, you know, safe again with needles and feel like they can relax um, during the treatment. Uh, this does include needles going into the skin, but just very, a, a very short uh, way into the skin, very cursory amount. 
um, and on the surface, but able to hit these meridians and pressure points in the body that help with um, enhancing, all, you know, all of these processes. Um, and so it's expensive in some places. Uh, however, it, it, you know, some insurances are now starting to cover acupuncture, which is great. Um, and some might also cover massage. So check in with your insurance company to see if that is something they might be willing to do. So here's just some, you know, some statistics on the benefits of acupuncture. So we have seen that, you know, against, you know, sham points. Uh, so that means that they have put the needles into points that are not those pressure points or meridians that I was saying to see if those still have the same effect, i.e. was it just the placebo of having needles somewhere in the body. Um, and what they found is that that is not the case, that those specific acupressure points and acupuncture points points um, are really significant in, in, you know, producing the healing or analgesic effect or, you know, um, modulating those body systems. Um, so the effect of acupuncture can last six to 12 months, um, including symptoms leading to an increased quality of life, lowered pain, increased joint mobility, less fatigue, less depression, and improved sleep. Um, and, you know, acupuncture plus physical therapy is actually superior to just physical therapy alone in reducing pain intensity. So if you can try to encourage your patient or client to do both of those, if they, if they can, if it's not too overwhelming, I understand that they are also seeing many providers potentially and, you may want to just check in with them and say, would it be too overwhelming to potentially try, you know, an acupuncture, you know, therapist maybe every couple of weeks or, um, but just check in and see what, what their level of comfort with that might be. Virtual reality and chronic pain. So we have had a lot of studies that have begun to use virtual reality technology uh, to help, especially specifically with um, burn victims. So individuals who have to go through extremely painful, just horrifically painful dressing changes and, and wound care. And are, exp I mean, expressing pain levels that are, you know, you know 27 on a 0 to 10 scale like it's just outrageously painful and what they have found is that creating this snow world which is just this kind of like a Nintendo type of game where they're shooting snowballs at objects and they're like going down you know ice hills and sledding and you know they're really operating in this snow world that's all cold and frozen um, to counter that effect of, of the burning and just the stinging. And they have had significant success um, with virtual reality and chronic pain. So we look at even, you know, people playing video games now. Uh, and we see that for a lot of times people can play for hours and hours and hours and completely ignore, oh, I guess I do have to go to the bathroom. Oh, I guess I am hungry. Um, so we can even see how that can be very distracting to some of our, our body cues and how um, when you harnessed and used in a way to, to create a, a healthy and positive effect um, that, that we're seeing some, some pretty amazing results. So I want to talk a little bit about psychotherapies um, for the treatment of chronic pain. Um, so let's dive on in. So the psychotherapies that we're going to be talking about are motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and DBT. Also, um, many people may not have heard of radically open DBT. Um, so we're going to talk a little briefly about that and then also emotional awareness and expression therapy. So that would include the emotional freedom technique and EMDR. So why do we want to use these psychotherapies in helping individuals with chronic pain? So we have identified through research that 
self-efficacy and building a patient's self-efficacy is one of the strongest predictors in their success of coping and dealing with chronic pain or pain-related conditions. Their belief in their ability to manage their illness, to manage a treatment plan, to also manage their life and family at the same time is exponentially at times more important than even, you know, scans or actual tissue damage or, you know, what we're actually seeing physically occurring in the body. So self-efficacy predicts pain coping responses up to one year later, even when controlling for pain severity. So individuals that, you know, have really high self-efficacy with similar levels of reported pain are potentially reporting higher quality of life, more activities that they're engaging in, um, you know, so it's something for us to, to really pay attention to. Self-efficacy, you know, beliefs um, predict depression and catastrophizing, um, and catastrophizing and rumination is also a very significant predictor in negative coping with chronic pain. Um, because a, a person is spiraling um, when they're catastrophizing and they are starting to believe that there's no way out, there's no help, uh, and really starting to think in worst case scenarios and absolutes. Uh, and that affects potentially pain you know, intensity reports um, that interferes with daily activities and general mobility, uh, physical task performances across uh, you know, a variety of patient populations and measures. Um, Self-efficacy predicts when people return to work after multidisciplinary pain treatments. Um, and then also what treatments patients will select for their pain. You know, how much do they believe, you know, in their ability to show up to physical therapy twice a week? How much do they believe, you know, that they can handle the needles with acupuncture? Um, how much do they believe, you know, massage will really reduce pain levels at all from even a nine to an eight? Um, you know, what is their self-efficacy beliefs and their ability to engage in these potentially mitigating, um, you know, uh, in activities? Um, and also, how do they feel their, their treatment team is, is treating them? Do they have, you know, beliefs that they can go to their treatment team and ask questions and talk to them um, and get help? Um, so a lot of things impact that self-efficacy that we really want to talk to them about. A rigid approach to treatment and limited cognitive flexibility is something that is, you know, really creates negative coping at times and um, a lot of life dissatisfaction when people are convinced that there's a right way or a wrong way to manage chronic pain. You know, I think maybe some of us have heard, like, I've taken these opioids for 30 years and they have been working for me this whole time and I know that that's the right way that I want to be treated and that's it. And, you know, the other part of us is going, well, but you've been on them for 30 years and and I'm wondering if that has been as helpful as, you, as you, you're thinking it is um, because you know, if it is, I wonder, would that have been fixed after year one or two? Um, but if we're on them for 30 years, what's happening? Um, so just being able to present it in a very gentle way, you know, asking some of these questions and presenting some of these concepts to them. Catastrophizing is that magnif magnification of the threat, right? How are they viewing their illness? How are they viewing pain? You know, are they looking at pain? All pain is bad pain. You know, have they been an athlete before in their life and understand kind of good hurt versus bad hurt? Where after a great workout, you know, your muscles feel sore and your body is just hurting, but you know you worked it, you know you did something healthy. Do they know the difference? between between those hurts and those pain you know how can we talk to them about awareness in their body and what they're feeling um, because that's a huge piece of the fear and trigger avoidance is you know that that they're going to feel a certain level of pain absolutely and it's going to last a certain amount of time absolutely and that they are absolutely not going to be able to handle it when that does happen um, and so right we want to make sure that that we you know, help encourage flexibility, you know, gosh, it feels like, did pain help you know when you needed to, to go into labor and when you need to have a baby? Like, even though that was 
that was pretty intense pain, like that feels like that was helpful for you to know when your body needed to go into labor. Um, so just even presenting different types of pain in a way that, that people might understand them in a different way. Um, we really want to be careful with withdrawing and isolation. Uh, that's something that happens quite frequently with individuals who have chronic pain because they feel like people don't understand. Um, they can't do as much as other people um, and some of those inflexible beliefs. Um, they think, oh, everybody, I'm just going to be left behind. Everybody's going to be so much faster than I am or either going to go longer than I am and I just might not, I shouldn't even go at all. Um, and so that can significantly limit willingness, um, you know, to engage in healthy, healthy activities and behaviors. Um, we also know that there is some issues with, at times, misinterpretation or the lens of how they're seeing providers. Um, we have to, you know, we cannot make the assumption that every experience they've had with a provider has been positive. Um, and so that there might be um, a lot of misinterpretations or some at least within, you know, how you're talking, you know, to them or with them or, you know, if if they're feeling like you're talking at them versus with them, um, you know, you, you want to just keep checking in um, and saying, you know, you know, are you are you, what are you hearing me say and how, you know what does that mean to you and you know are you hearing that i'm saying you're not in pain at all because that's not what i'm saying you know what what are you hearing right now We want to be culturally competent and understand how uh, other cultures and other countries, you know, think about chronic pain. Um, for example, only 10% of adult dental patients in China routinely receive local anesthetic injections for their dental tooth drilling versus 99% of adult patients in North America. Um, this this person too. <laughs> um, and so just, wow, like just the radical difference even looking at just how they approach dental, you know, pain and discomfort, um, and even acute um, pain treatments um, are, are pretty different uh, worldwide and culturally. There's evidence that African Americans are more likely than Caucasian individuals to use praying, hoping, and emotion-focused coping. Also, differences in use of distraction, catastrophizing, and problem-focused solving between African Americans and Caucasians. Um, so, if we look back at some of the discrimination and potential bias in treatment of African American individuals or individuals of color, um, it makes sense that maybe they have to rely more on praying, hoping, and, and emotion-focused strategies because they're not getting the medication that they need, or they're not not being seen by the providers that they need to or they don't have access uh, financially to some of the other treatments um, that might be available. Uh, so it's not as always straightforward as they just prefer <laughs> to use that as a, as a strategy. Um, it's what, what's been available to them to use and, and how have they used all the resources that, that have been available. Spanish individuals were more likely than Dutch individuals with fibromyalgia to have negative illness perception. So just those beliefs of the self-efficacy, what it means to you as a person to be sick chronically, uh, and your ability to still find meaning in life, even though you have uh, fibromyalgia or chronic pain. So if we look at some of the, um, actually, you know what? I, it is about 126 right now. So why don't we come back at about 130, 131, um, and I will continue. Um, and we will dive into a few more of these um, psychotherapy techniques. However you spent that time. Uh, let's dive into talking about motivational interviewing. So motivational interviewing was actually um, created uh, as part of kind of substance uh, and cessation, right? So it was, you know, really actually generated at first to deal with people that were struggling with addictions and trying to figure out what their motivation to change was. You know, why, what was this substance serving in their life and why would they want to change? You know, how is it benefiting them? How would their life be better if they didn't have it? And, you know, what we've found is that these motivational interviewing techniques really do apply to people who are experiencing life ambivalence in a number of different ways or domains. And chronic pain is one of those, right? Um, if there are 
you know, doctors or providers who are suggesting making lifestyle changes in accordance with what we know might might help, you know, mitigate some of those chronic pain levels, but they're not ready for them or they object to them or, you know, maybe, you know, at some level, they don't even know if they want to live anymore. You know, we can't force these techniques on them and we certainly can't force them to engage in them. And so we have to figure out what their specific motivation is if they want to live their life and why. Um, and so part of uh, an MI technique is just ORs. Um, so using those open-ended questions, using affirmations, using reflective listening, and using summaries. So it's a very gentle approach. So if you just look at the questions and some examples, like in what way have you seen chronic pain impact the lives of others? What about their families? You know, have you had any negative experiences with medical challenges in the past? What was negative about them? You know, how, how did you approach dealing with that? You know, what are, what are skills that you maybe learned in the past that got you through a really intense time? Could we lean on some of those skills now? What was helpful then that may not be helpful now or vice versa? Um, and so just again, how can you really just be curious and really try to see, you know, from your patient or client's point of view, uh, how they're feeling about this, how they're feeling about their life and what this pain means to their identity. I also realize I say again a lot, so I apologize. <laughs> That's just part of my nerves in speaking. But uh, so let's move on to talking a little bit about you know CBT um, meeting kind of MI and a chronic pain. So the premise of CBT, the essence of CBT, is a quote from Epictetus: "Man is not disturbed by things, but by the view which they take of them." So nothing is either good or bad. It's our thinking, it's our making the meaning of it that attaches, you know, negativity to it. Um, and so we really want, what is the lens? What's the lens that people are viewing their chronic pain from? Are, you know, have they never had to deal with the chronic pain in their life? And this is the first time. And they're completely lost and feel like I can't do this. You know, is this something that they've been dealing with, you know, like, like maybe I have since age 11 where, okay, like it's one more, one more diagnosis, one more thing. Let's do it. Let's figure out what we've got to fit, you know, do let's meet the doctors. Let's, you know, get going. It's about perception, you know, and Beverly Thorne, who's an amazing pain psychologist, um, who actually has some great group um, and individual CBT protocols that are available for people says that we can look at these stressors in life in general, but especially with chronic pain from one of th three places, as a threat, as a loss, or as a challenge. And maybe you'll see it as all three, but where you put your energy the most significantly impacts how you're going to cope with this, what, you're, what steps you're going to take to deal with it. If you feel this is a challenge, Maybe you attend a seminar like this and you learn about it. If you think this is a challenge, maybe you call up so-and-so from 10 years ago who you remember had this diagnosis and you want to get their perspective and talk to them and learn. You know, it, how can you view this as an opportunity to learn and to grow and to see it as a challenge that, you know, you can overcome like so many other challenges in your life? CBT focuses on activities that contribute to behavior modification by altering that motivation to change. So we really want to help them reduce the, the pain perception and experience. We want to re reduce psychological distress. We want to have them potentially redefine successful functioning. We want to see, is your expectation that you have no pain and that that is the only way that you feel that your quality of life and your level of functioning is is successful and appropriate you know are you re realizing that probably not going to happen that you're ever pain free completely and how do we function even though we're not completely pain free how can we increase adaptive behaviors and decrease some of the maladaptive behaviors 
you know, a quote that I love is every healthy behavior is an act of gratitude to the body that you've been given. How can you show gratitude with adaptive behaviors to your body? How can you say thank you? Um, you know, even with like a glass of water, you know, how can we say thank you to our bodies and increase these adaptive behaviors? How can we also correct maladaptive thoughts and beliefs, um, right? Like I said, if somebody thinks I'm not brave enough to deal with this, I'm not strong enough to deal with this. I've been told my whole life that I'm weak. There's no way I'm gonna be able to fight this. Um, if they've been told these things and they believe these things, and these are the thoughts with which they're approaching their treatment, they're gonna see it as a threat or a loss um, or something that is just, really con consuming them. Um, and that could be the difference between being a person that has chronic pain and feeling like they are the chronic pain. So CBT can be delivered in an individual therapy format or a group therapy format. Um, individual therapy, they recommend, you know, data has shown, you know, greatest success with um, sticking with present day kind of issues and um, triggers. So, you know, what are your thoughts about this doctor's appointment that's coming up on Wednesday? Um, you know, what are the questions that you want to be able to ask this doctor? How do you want to ask it? What does it mean if they're not able to answer it or if you don't get the response? that maybe you're wanting. Um, solutions focused questions, um, looking at again that how how have they developed these beliefs about themselves, about other people, and just kind of the world at large. Um, you know, and in CBT, they kind of suggest that all of our life experiences contribute to two kind of core negative beliefs that people tend to have more than more than others. And, and so there can be an infinite number of, of negative core beliefs, but that this fear of being seen as incompetent or this fear of being seen as unlovable in their life really drives a lot of these cognitive distortions and negative beliefs about themselves. So if, for example, somebody has linked productivity to success their entire life and they can no longer work because they have chronic pain and they feel completely incompetent and unlovable because they're not producing and contributing in the way that they feel they should, uh, how, is, how has this impacted their sense of self and, and their ability to be in the world? So we wanna find the cognitive distortions. Um, there are a lot of resources um, that we can give to our clients and patients that talk about different cognitive distortions. So like I said, catastrophizing is a cognitive distortion, talking in absolutes, is a cognitive distortion, worst case scenario, judgment and filtering. Um, all of these, you know, these cognitive distortions suggest that people can have a more rigid approach to thinking about their pain or themselves or their ability to deal with it. Um, so here are a few examples of cognitive distortions. I'm useless now that my life is consumed by chronic pain. If I cannot get back to who I was before the pain, I can never enjoy my life, right? See the absolute there? I've lost everything that is important to me in my life because of chronic pain. Is that, is that true? Everything was important to you? Well, what are all of the important things to you in your life? You know, share with me what you feel like you've lost. And are there any things there that you still enjoy or interact with that have meaning? coming back to the curious questions and not critical questions. We want to understand how they're seeing it. How does it feel today? You know, if you could give it, you know, instead of a number, if you could give it a color, what would it be? If you could, you know, really challenge their ability to think about their pain in different ways. Show them that that we don't have to be rigid in the way that we conceptualize it or even the language we use to talk about it. Uh, one thing that I really love that's kind of consistent with ACT, which I'll, I'll talk a little about here in a second, is just a simple language pattern shift. So instead of I have to, right, I have to go to the doctor, I have to go exercise, I have to go to my PT, I have to, I have to, I have to, how about we change that one word to want to? 
Right. Instead of a should or have to, what if it is I want to? Because it's somehow consistent with their value system and beliefs. I want to go to physical therapy because I want to walk my daughter down the aisle in November, which is what my dad did in just getting his knee replacement. I want to be able to do this aquatic therapy because I want to show my kids that I'm not afraid of water anymore and that I can move my body in so many ways. You know, why? Why do they want to do this? Why do they want their body to work for them? Why does it matter to them? We also want to make sure that they're not putting judgments on themselves and saying, oh, I could have done better or gosh, I just did such a bad job. No. What was helpful or unhelpful? What was effective or ineffective in helping you live the life that you want? The life that feels fulfilling, comfortable, safe, you know, fill in the blank. How is it effective in helping you reach those goals? Not how did you do a bad job or how did you fail? That can change, you know, how somebody approaches a new task every single day. CBT for chronic pain uh, group work. Uh, this has been, so I, I was able to run CBT groups for chronic pain individuals in Pennsylvania as well when I was in my residency. And this is some of the most inspiring work that I've ever done, being able to see these resilient, brave individuals come together, share their stories and their vulnerability, um, but to also have a space where they don't feel alone can honestly mean the difference between, you know, you know, significantly high active suicidal ideation and, you know, even just passive ideation, um, you know, feeling like they have a community and they belong somewhere can I cannot under, uh, understate the importance of that. And so how we constructed our um, groups was we did 12 session approaches where we broke down each session into a different kind of topic or theme that we did. So we started with the education parts, looking at some of that neuromatrix theory and explaining what pain actually is and how our brain processes it. And then kind of going as I did in that first lecture, like how does nutrition affect it? How about sleep hygiene? Um, and we do this also with relaxation training. We do mindfulness activities. We talk about cognitive distortions and negative core beliefs. We really take individuals through the process, kind of what I've shared with you today, uh, in and helping them reintegrate these skills or, or integrate for the first time these skills into their life. We have activity pacing is something that's really important to talk about with individuals that have chronic pain. I think a lot of us have heard our people say, Oh, I had this one good day out of out of like 10. So I just did everything I could that day. I just I went to the store, I cleaned my house, and I picked up the poop, the dog poop in the backyard, and I did all the things. And then I couldn't move the next 10 days. And I was completely exhausted and in so much pain. And you know, so we want to be able to say, how can we break that up? You know, also, why is why are you putting the pressure on yourself to get all of these things done? You know, what does it mean if the house isn't always clean? Or what does it mean if the house is dirty for a couple extra days? Or what does it mean if we actually ask, you know, a neighbor to help us come clean, you know, one room? And maybe that helps us feel a little less overwhelmed. But how can we activity pace in a way that's going to give us, you know, a sense of, of accomplishment, but also, you know, taking care of ourselves and, and normalizing that productivity isn't everything. That are, you know, we are called human beings, not human doings for a reason. Um, I, I like to remind people of that. So, you might experience this theme of questions that are open-ended and curious, not critical. It's really important that we come back to that as much as we can. Uh, and that even questions that we might find completely innocuous and benign, 
may not land that way uh, for an individual. Um, you know, just even this week, I was working with somebody where we were exploring a work situation, and I, I thought I was asking curious questions, like what, you know, what do you think might might be better, you know, or what, not better, but what do you think might be an alternative option? You know, what might be another job that interests you? Um, and she felt like I was being critical um, and shared that with me. And I loved that she shared that with me, that she felt like, oh, I feel like you're wanting me to quit. And that was not my goal. Um, so feedback, check in with feedback. Um, how can you ask things in a really open-ended way um, that really feel neutral? We try to do the downward arrow technique, um, which it's a little bit complicated to kind of explain, but essentially what we want to do is we want to get to these core beliefs that people have. So if they come in and they have a cognitive distortion that says, you know, I can't run like I used to run and I'm so upset about it. Okay, well, we ask then, what does that mean about you if you can't run anymore? Oh, well, then I'm going to gain all this weight and I'm not going to be desirable. Okay, what does that mean about you if you gain the weight and you're not desirable? Well, then my husband will leave me or my spouse will leave me or my family won't love me. And then we get to the core, right, of what it is actually about oh, it's about you feeling this rejection potentially if your body is not a certain way and you're not functioning at a certain level. And okay, we can talk about this and then we can actually also maybe talk about expectations other people have for you and maybe that that's a distortion too. We use SMART goals. Uh, I try to have people um, set goals for themselves that they can achieve with a 90% degree of certainty because success breeds success. We really want people to feel like these are very achievable, very easy to accomplish. So like I said, if one day, you know what, my SMART goal is to have an extra glass of water that's specific, it's measurable, one glass, I feel like it's achievable, it's relevant because I know hydration is important and I have more energy and also it helps me not get migraines and it's timely. I can do it right now and today. Um, you know, so how can we break down um, these goals for people? Maybe it's, I'm gonna take one extra trip up and down the stairs, right? Same thing, I'm gonna take a walk to the mailbox and back today. Um, how can we create goals that feel feasible to people who sometimes think that taking a shower is like climbing Mount Everest. You know, that's the perspective that we need to have is that, you know, just getting up some days is so hard. Um, also some, some interesting CBT techniques that I like to use. Um, using a rubber band to kind of do the thought stopping if you are ruminating. So I, I tell people if you find that, you know, you just all of a sudden realize that you've been just completely lost in the spiral, try to use your rubber band and flick your wrist. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I even say like, that's kind of what you're doing to yourself internally when you're thinking all these negative things about you. Like you're kind of, you know, whipping yourself and snapping yourself and being negative to yourself. And maybe if we had this example of that you're doing that, like it might make you more aware. And maybe you can stop and maybe you can pause and think of something that is, like I said, more of that act of gratitude towards my body. I love being able to set a worry time um, for people. So, you know what, the rest of my week is so busy, but on Friday afternoons from two to three, I've got a section where I can set my worry time. I can worry about all the what ifs, all the shoulda, woulda, couldas, I can do all of that, but I'm gonna keep it concentrated into that amount of time so that it's not affecting every day, all day, where I have these intrusive thoughts or these random, you know, really negative feelings, I'm gonna, Set them aside for my worry time. So. Act is something that I love to combine with um, cognitive behavioral therapy as it promotes psychological flexibility. And so I've been talking about kind of that struggle with these fused thoughts. So that's the acceptance, the cognitive diffusion. And so that is essentially how can we create more of that? You know, even if my life doesn't look a certain way, I can still 
have joy and fulfillment. I can still, you know, I can accept that I have a chronic illness and I can still move forward and, you know, establish goals and, you know, uh, make friends and do all of the things. Um, and really act is very values heavy which like i said i i love you know because it comes back to the why why do you want to take care of your body why do you want to live in your life um and then being able to talk about those committed actions how can we create action steps for you that make sense um act uses a lot of metaphor and visualization uh in the mindfulness and their techniques which is really helpful um for some people you know, even if we like use, you know, if your pain is is a baby tiger, let's say, and every negative thought is like you're feeding the tiger more and more and more. And yeah, this baby tiger all of a sudden becomes this huge beast and it's coming at you. So how can we how can we not feed that? How can we not feed that tiger? Like and and maybe think about it like that or, you know, whatever analogy or metaphor um, might make sense um, for them. So ACT has been helpful in um, studies. So they did a meta-analysis looking at 25 studies. It reduced anxiety, pain interference, pain intensity, depression. Um, it decreased rates of disability and increased quality of life. One of the other things that I love about ACT is that it really, um, it really promotes, you know, being able to do things with accommodations, right? It's not can't, it's how can I do this, even if it's different? How can I do this, you know, and just accept that the sooner that I, I realize I have a chronic illness and that this is gonna be a part of my life, the sooner I can move forward with it, the sooner I can begin to integrate the tools I need to be functional, um, you know, and that people mistake acceptance for giving up. And that's not what acceptance is. Acceptance is not defeat. And that's something that's really important to recognize that acceptance is kind of the first step in in galvanizing yourself to move forward it's saying yeah i i'm a person that is going to be dealing with this chronic pain and you know i i know that the sooner i realize this i can set up appointments that i need for physical therapy i can i can set my you know smart goals i can actually decide what i need and you know where i'm at um i've heard a lot of people say you know that like, oh, I'm just, I'm waiting for this until the pain stops, or I'm waiting to do this until I feel better, or I'm waiting, you know, and I encourage people, like, try it now. You know, maybe it won't be as long as it won't, you know, you, you might not do it as long as you once could, you might not be able to go as far as you once could, you might, you know, it might look different than what you'd envisioned at some point. And what if it doesn't get better? What if it never gets to this point where you feel no pain, right? Do we put off living until then? How can we create life and quality and meaning even when we're sick? Um, so an alternative thought that we can have is if I accept that this is my reality, I may learn how to reconstruct my identity by working with my chronic illness in my daily life. Um, sometimes I have people even name their pain um, so that they can talk to it, so they can have conversations. Um, maybe that sounds silly to some, but for some, it, it really takes the power away um, from the chronic pain. Um, I had um, an ileostomy bag at one point in my life, and it was at, at several points in my life, and it was very challenging to adjust to that and how that changed my body. And um, I hated my stoma. I absolutely hated it. And I decided one day, look, we can either fight or we can be friends. And so I named my stoma Stewie. And Stewie and I, we had some arguments along the way, but we learned how to communicate with each other. We learned that we didn't have to fight every time. And, you know, that the sooner I realized that I, I didn't have to take this so seriously and fight it so hard and hate it so much, that I could actually work with it you know, that I could actually learn from Stewie. And let me tell you, he taught me lots of patience. 
Um, so just how can we help our, our clients and patients think about things um, in, a, in a way that's personal and, and maybe changes their relationship with their illness. So I wanna talk about DBT now. I was just doing a time check. Um, so dialectical behavioral therapy for chronic pain, if we wanna teach distress, so the four major components of DBT are distress tolerance, emotion regulation skills, mindfulness, and interpersonal skills. So we wanna be able to, because you know we know so many of these issues are also associated. So again, distress intolerance or emotion dysregulation, we know increases chronic pain levels. Um, we know that with those, um, you know, with distress intolerance and emotion dysregulation, you know, our stress hormones are surging a lot more, you know, some of those endogenous opioids, um, you know, receptors might be surging, you know, lots of different things could be happening in our body that we want to take care of. We want to check in. We want to make sure um, that we can calm down and regulate. Um, and EMDR, they call it your window of tolerance. Um, we want to make sure that we can get the body within kind of, you know, not hyper arousal, not hypo arousal, but in our window of tolerance. So some techniques for mindfulness that we can use and mindfulness just so that people, because I, again, I think it's like the hot button word that, that people use, but what mindfulness really means is just staying in the present moment without judgment. Um, just trying to observe and be in the present without attaching a judgment to it. Um, and so one of the ways that we can do that is just do the observe and describe, right? So just pause, look around you in the room and just you know, start to describe things that you see. Um, we could do a take five, which is name five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can touch, two you can smell, one you can taste. And that helps um, take their mind off of the spiral, right, that might be happening. The tip skill is great, T is temperature. So we, we suggest that people fill up a sink with ice water and submerge their face in it as many times as possible. This activates the dive reflex within the body. And so again, your body is going, oh, I need to regulate my breath. Oh, because I'm underwater. Oh, I need to regulate temperature because this is freezing. And it, it you know, kind of shakes the body in a way that, that gets us out of that limbic system and back into our body, right? Diaphragmatic breathing, pretty simple, you know, uh, again, putting your hand on your chest and hand on your stomach and helping them see the difference between breathing through their stomach and having their stomach rise and instead of their chest, right? We can get much deeper breaths if we're breathing from our stomach instead of our chest. We also focus on harm reduction in DBT. And this I find is really helpful for uh, individuals, especially who are thinking about tapering or titrating down on opioids or who are potentially using alcohol or other substances with um, some of their pain medications, because it can, this is what their solution has been. This is what to them has been helping them function and get through their day and maybe go to work or maybe be a parent or, you know, so we have to be really careful that we don't take this thing completely away from them that in their mind has, has literally been the thing that's allowed them to, to live. Um, and so sometimes that like, so I had an individual where we started with, okay, let's have a fifth of vodka last, every two days instead of every one day with your medicine. Um, and maybe to some people that sounds like, oh my gosh, that's so dangerous. And that's so like, how could you like, that's not a good suggestion. Like, and by doing that, it took a lot less time for her to make the choice on her own because I was not sitting there going, oh, you're doing what? Oh my gosh, I can't believe you're drinking that much. Like, do you know how bad that is? Do you know you're not supposed to do that? Do you know how, like, because that's judgment. That's more judgment. And in working with this individual, I learned that that was all she ever got from her mom when she was growing up was judgment, was criticism, was how much she did everything wrong. And if I was one more person to tell her, you're doing this wrong, what would that have done? She probably wouldn't have come back. 
she probably, it, it could have even been, you know, super detrimental to her health. Radically open DBT. So radically open DBT is a little different than just regular DBT because it is geared more towards disorders of over control, whereas DBT is kind of more for disorders of under control, right? So we have some of those, the borderline personality disorder, narcissistic, kind of our cluster B um, personality disorders where we have that under control right where the the re regulation of the emotions is all over the place they just don't have the skills and then we have those individuals that you know because it is pro-social at some level to be very over controlled right to be on time all the time to never get in trouble to always see the right thing to always wear the right thing to you know that at some level it's it's pro social that we accomplish you know uh, certainly like individuals in graduate school like there were a lot of people that were very over controlled um, and it served to them quite well um, because they needed to be on top of so many things however um, that can get to the place of really rigid um, and cognitive and flexibility, right? If you're so over controlled, you have a really low receptivity and openness. Um, so that can be with people and with thoughts and with beliefs or concepts or Western medicine versus Eastern medicine. Um, if you have low flexible control, I can't trust this doctor to tell me what to do because they, I don't know them. They don't know me. They, I'm not gonna, they're telling me this is gonna help, but uh uh, no, I'm not gonna give them that control low flexible control um, pervasive inhibited emotional expression and low emotional awareness so again just this you know i've got to have everything together i've got to have everything tight i've got to present a certain way to the world i can't let them see my pain i can't let them see that i'm i'm having a hard time um, which also means low social connectedness and intimacy with others like if you are trying so hard to hide that you're in pain all the time from people why would you want to be around people then if you had to work so hard to hide it. Um, so being able to talk about what these concepts mean uh, in a person's life and how they're showing up in their relationships. And so this slide just talks a little bit more about, you know, what that looks like. So low receptivity and openness, so not open to novel or unexpected or disconfirming feedback. Um, that low flexible control, um, hyper perfectionism, pervasive inhibited emotional expression, low emotional awareness is that inhibition of emotional expression or incongruent expressions, right? Like if, if something, you know, you feel like is really upsetting and they're just, yeah, it was, you know, it was okay and whatever, you know. Like, we've got to ask, okay, where are you putting that emotion then? Where is it going? Because I'm not, see I'm not seeing it here. Um, and, and again, maybe they don't have the same level of emotional response that I would have had. That's not the point. But it's, you know, if I'm not seeing a lot of that emotional expression with something that feels like it might be intense, um, maybe that's an indication that they are repressing some of that emotion internally and it could be contributing to their pain. We talk about the John Sarno, um, you know, that if you look at the personality characteristics in that over-controlled, you know, um, kind of dynamic with the RODBT, you can see those clusters of traits, right? The conscientiousness, the perfectionist, the, you know, low social connectedness. And so we can see how the two, you know, how are we tying everything together and how do all of these theories also, you know, build off of each other? Um, so we want to promote um, psychological well-being with receptivity, with flexibility, with social connectedness. Also, you know, with receptivity, how much are they personalizing in their life in a potentially negative way? You know, if they are driving and somebody honks at them, you know, are they literally thinking that this person hates them more than anybody else in the whole world and that they are just a failure and, blah, 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 you know, like, or can they have a receptivity to feedback from their environment and go, hmm, okay, you know, I don't have to feed it. I don't have to, you know, attach this really negative meaning to it. I can be flexible in what that might mean. You know, there's a phrase in, in DBT, a willingness, not a willfulness. 
So a willingness to lean into the experience and into the present moment and not a willfulness of trying to control it, of trying so hard to, you know, direct it and guide it and have it be a certain way. Um, you know, we can hope, uh, but there's a big difference between hope and expectation, right? When we, when we have expectations, that's when we lose our flexibility. That's when we start with the shoulds. Um, and that's not a helpful approach with, or as helpful as other approaches with chronic pain. So just for the sake of time, I'm gonna go a little bit faster. I'm gonna pass through this one. This just talks about, you know, the RODVT therapist, like I said, promoting, um, you know, these, the, the, you know, validating the experiences, you know, also helping them just have fun and be silly in life that a part of this over control is that they've become so you know duty bound and potentially you know productivity based or over controlled that they've maybe forgotten how to just laugh and have fun and be silly um also like i said repair alliance ruptures you know with an individual that's over controlled you know because they are so self-monitored and they're so self-aware sometimes they're hypercritical um, of what you might say and how you might act or what your body language might be. Um, so just kind of be aware of that, that that might show up as well. Treatment quality indicators. We really need a lot more data to standardize um, these, you know, the efficacy and the effectiveness. So efficacy, meaning the randomized controlled trial and empirical data and effectiveness what does this actually look like in practice um, with our chronic pain populations? And, and that is including across cultures, across ages, across um, socioeconomic status, you know, uh, how can we really begin to incorporate the whole biopsychosocial spiritual model in, in trying to find standardized treatments or at least more of a standardized approach? We need manuals, we need therapists who have training or providers or people who are attending, you know, um, educational chronic pain uh, seminars, um, you know, people that are aware of the biopsychosocial spiritual model and can explain that and can offer, you know, different perspectives and solutions for people. So soliciting feedback. Um, and patient satisfaction is really, really important. Uh, checking in, you know, every session is pretty core to CBT, DVT, and MI, um, and I, even core to some of these. So the next two that we're gonna talk about, emotional awareness and expression therapy. Um, with, the, so this is much more somatic based, the emotional awareness and expression therapy. Um, we've seen that um, like the results of this have potentially had better outcomes than just our CBT um, and kind of our DBT approaches that are a bit more cognitively based. Um, I can't tell you how many people report to me like, I can tell you logically that I'm lovable or that I'm competent, but I don't feel it. Like, I don't feel it. Like when I walk into that meeting uh, and I know I've got to pre like give a presentation, I don't feel like I'm competent. And then my back starts to hurt so much, like, cause I just am feeling it, um, you know? And so the difference between where, where did that memory get stored in the body and how, you know, what happened to this person in the past that's creating that trigger um, and potentially creating that physiological response. So we've seen that we need a little bit more. And so early studies that have been looking at, you know, these different approaches that combine the more somatic approach um, have been shown, you know, uh, efficacy in IBS studies, um, pelvic pain studies, um, non-specific musculoskeletal pain. Um, and this really builds off of the John Sarno, like I was saying, those concepts, the mind-body prescription, the divided mind, really looking at where have you repressed or stored you know different memories in your body that might be contributing to pain that might be contributing to distress right now so there's something called the emotional freedom technique um, that was created by an individual named gary craig um, and so this 
has been deemed by some people the tapping technique. Um, essentially, there are nine different acupressure points that they have established on the body through through a myriad of randomized control trials. Again, using it against sham points, you know, to see effectiveness and, and efficacy if that changed. And these nine points emerged time and time again um, as the most helpful in reducing um, stress levels, in reducing, you know, biomarkers that we would associate with inflammation, um, you know, cortisol levels, um, C-reactive protein levels. Like we have been able to look at some of the before and after, you know, in taking blood work and saliva samples and things like that to really be able to see this marked difference um, in this tapping technique. And so what the nine points would look like um, is that we would start on the, the the karate chop point, which is right on the side of the hand, and this is where we do our setup statements. So it's right on that pinky side of the hand. And I'm going to go quickly and probably just do one round because of the sake of time, but it would go something like, even though I can't focus on anything but how much my back hurts right now, I know that I want to stay in the present moment and let some of it go. Even though it feels like it's so sharp and painful, I'm going to focus on my breathing and relaxing my muscles instead. Even though it feels like this is never going to stop and I'm so tired, I'm just going to focus on staying in the moment and relaxing my body. And then we go to the top of the head. So all of these are meridians or acupressure points on the body that are associated with emotional and physical release. So then I would go, my back, it's so sore. It is so sore and throbbing. It hurts when I bend over to put my shoes on. I feel so stiff. I feel so stiff today. And it makes me super frustrated and angry. I get so mad. Why can't my back work with me? Why do I have to fight this every single day? I can't, I just want to put my shoes on. I just want to, is that too much to ask? I just want to put my shoes on. And the first sequence that you do, so you do multiple sequences when you're with people, the first is as negative as it really is for this person. We really want to be honest and open. You know, this is, I feel like, taken away my life. You know, have they seen the threat? Have they seen the loss? So under the nose, under the chin, an inch below the collarbone here, and then right under the underarm where the bra hits the underarm for women. Um, and we talk through, so we have them identify, you know, what is the issue for you, the MPI? So maybe that's their back pain, maybe it's neck pain, you know, whatever that might be. Have them describe what that feels like. And then we always do a suds, you know, so we always do, you know, what's that level? you know, on a one to 10 before we do it. And then we always check in and do a suds after we do it. Um, did that go down? You know, if it if it went down some, what, it, what do we need to make it go down even more? Um, if it didn't go down, what's happening? Are we maybe not identifying the emotion or the piece that's really connecting to that? Um, and so just really kind of using that as a barometer also for um, how they're how they're experiencing it and what's happening for them. So again, I just am giving, you know, there, there is so much research and data on the emotional freedom technique. I highly recommend um, Peta Stapleton's The Science of Tapping. Um, she has a, an excellent book um, that talks about all these randomized control trials um, and how successful, um, you know, the treatment has been in a mere, you know, again, copious disorders. You can see the range of disorders. Um, you can, you know, learn, they've done even studies like genome-wide association studies where they've actually seen genetic changes in people, you know, where they sequence the genome before and after 10 weeks of one hour a week of using the emotional freedom technique. Um, particularly, they started with a group of soldiers that had PTSD um, and identified six genes that were associated with active PTSD in this, this participant group. And after 10 weeks of one hour a week of doing this emotional freedom technique, 
those six genes have down-regulated and everybody in that population. Um, and so like staggering results um, to, to be able to talk about, you know, when we talk about, you know, epigenetics and telomere, um, you know, damage and, you know, chromosomal issues, this could potentially help heal at a genetic level, which is amazing. And then EMDR, um, so we're, we're running out of time um, with EMDR, but EMDR has eight phases. Um, so first it's the treatment planning and history taking, um, but the second one is really important, the preparation, because this is when we do the safety and resource building, where we do, you know, how, so there are things that we call creating a safe calm place within the body. Um, there is a tree meditation um, that I do with individuals that build builds again the sense of groundedness um, and steadiness and then we get into assessment and de, you know desensitization and it's it's a lot to explain and it's it's going to be challenging to explain it in 15 minutes and so what I'm going to just say with this is that the premise behind MDR is that say say we are born a tree and we are the trunk and through all of our life experiences, we have branches of beliefs that we develop. And so let's say one branch is I'm strong, you know, and, and all the beliefs and experiences we have that tell us we're strong. And then another branch has I'm weak. And then all these memories and beliefs that have happened to us that have made us believe that, you know, all of that is getting stored in our body, you know, from age one to three to five to, you know, and we're storing it unless we're processing it and getting it out. And that's what keeps getting triggered in all these different instances, you know, for people when they are walking into that conference room and all of a sudden they feel their, their cheeks get really hot and red. Maybe they just went back to the elementary school talent show when they, forgot all the words to the song and were completely embarrassed in front of everybody. And that's what they're feeling right in that moment. And it's creating this feeling of incompetency or, um, you know, uh, just there, it's a trauma trigger, right? It's an adverse experience trigger. We carry those in our body. And that's what Sarno is also talking about, has the ability to create pain. If we let that manifest, um, if we let that um, build over time, you know, to fester, I mean, that's what creates some of these really um, serious illnesses. So these are just different ways of doing that preparation phase with EMDR. So um, I have different meditations, which I also have available if, if anybody's interested in hearing them. Um, I've just recorded them. Um, I did my EMDR training with um, an individual called Rebecca Case out of Colorado, um, who was just absolutely phenomenal. Um, I can also have resources if anybody is interested in training um, where a lot of my resources that I use are based on based on her, um, you know, program, and she has scripts, and she has so many resources that um, have been. I cannot tell you how impactful they have been um, in helping people. So, like installing the safe home place, for example using bilateral stimulation because that's a central component of EMDR. Um, and so the bilateral stimulation can be the eye movements, which is our pretty kind of, you know, recognizable um, form of bilateral stimulation that we do with people or we do tapping. We can either do slow or fast tapping. But when we're doing the safety resourcing, and specifically the safe calm place. I have people do, we do just a gentle left to right and a gentle rocking because you're passing over your center and you're activating every time you're moving right, you're activating your left brain. Every time you're moving left, you're activating your right brain. And in that way, we are really helping install um, that image and that experience. And so I have people bring up a complete representation of safety and peace 
and relaxation. Um, so for some people that's a beach, some people that's their home, their childhood home. Um, some people it's, you know, in the middle of the ocean on a boat and they just can, you know, really let go. Um, but it's to really help them create a different sense of peace and safety within their own body um, to show them that no matter where they are at, they can actually take themselves to a really, really safe, calm place. Um, and that's really powerful. Um, so just to kind of buzz through this, these are just kind of indicators or factors that might um, impact a treatment. Uh, financial, we've talked a lot about, we've talked about uh, environmental pieces, cultural pieces, um, stigma and care, and patient attitude, uh, we've talked about that as a factors in influencing um, psychotherapy success. Healthcare system barriers. Um, my hope in, is that all of you walking away from our, you know, seminars, is that you have more knowledge to be able to, to talk to your patients and clients and families um, about pain and you have more confidence in your own ability um, to treat and help people with this because that's a huge component as well of, of all of these treatment modalities working. Um, so we also, interestingly enough, just briefly in the pediatric care, like we are seeing that a certain subset of individuals who are um, afflicted in, in pediatric chronic pain are not as responsive um, to CBT or traditional psychotherapies. Um, they are needing more of the emotional and somatic mind-body um, psychotherapies that they're needing the fourth wave. Um, lots of different theories as to why that is. Potentially, they're not cognitively as developed, and so CBT doesn't necessarily make as much sense um, for their brains, um, but something that can help them with their bodies is maybe something that they can understand and feel a little bit more automatically. Just provider factors. Um, one of the things that I just, I, I really want to emphasize more than anything else is just burnout, <laughs> is burnout um, in terms of provider factors. Um, this is a very challenging population um, at times to work with. You know, while it's so incredibly rewarding, um, it can be very stressful too. Um, there, there are a lot of really intense issues and emotions. And so just please take care of yourself as providers. Um, you're human too. Um, and this is just, this is uh, an Australian um, questionnaire looking at clinician burnout that I think it's just good to, to even have and check in with your people on a regular basis, even if, even if you're not specifically working with chronic pain. Um, I think we've all been exhausted with the pandemic. Um, and so just be aware of how your mood, how your life and how, you know, what energy you're bringing into the room um, as providers. Um, I know that there were times where I probably had way too much on my plate and I was stretched really thin and might have been a little bit shorter or less present um, at times. And, and I think it's really important for us to also reflect on that. Um, and, and take care of ourselves. Um, so just points to take away. There are so many ways for us to conceptualize chronic pain and so many ways for us to understand it and treat it. And first and foremost, it needs to be from the human place. Um, how can we make sure that we are compassionate, empathetic, that we recognize that there are all different types of pain, all different types of people who have pain, that pain does not discriminate. Um, and that we also recognize that even if people can't communicate that they're in pain, that doesn't mean that they're not in pain. Also, um, again, that the biopsychosocial spiritual approach to managing chronic pain really does seem to allow for us to see a comprehensive 360 degree view of a person and a patient. And that, you know, we can, there, there, I'm sure there are people that want to stick with the biomedical model and fair enough for them. But my hope is that in the takeaway uh, of these sessions is that we really do see how, how much is involved, how many variables, how many factors contribute to somebody's experience with chronic pain and that we just remain humble. We remain humble to the pain and humble to the person. And that is where I will end. 
this is a, a beautiful quote um, that says, and then there are the intangible things that help, things that aren't considered medical therapies as such, but are crucial to healing from pain, acceptance, love, compassion, listening, respect, encouragement, trust, kindness, patience, and presence. So thank you all. All right, so at this time, thank you so much, Dr. Baskin, that was so amazing. This three-part pain series has just been absolutely incredible. I'm sure everyone that's attended all three of them and has watched has agreed with me. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, you can put them in the questions chat that's over on your handle over on the side, and we can read them off to Dr. Baskin while we have her here. Um, we have one participant that just said thank you with a whole bunch of exclamation marks. Wonderful. Um, no questions as of yet. If you do have questions, go ahead and drop them into the questions field. Uh, we have another one that said thank you, agreed. Thank you so much. Um, another couple housekeeping while you're getting your questions put in there is uh, just to please remember to go in and print out your or um, enter your activity code for your certificates. Um, it's on the eads.com website. The activity codes do expire within seven days, so please make sure that you get those entered. The activity code again is 07PANG on the eads.com website. I'm going to leave this up on the screen here for you for a few minutes if you need to jot it down on a piece of paper or take a picture of it real quick. Um, again, if you have any questions that arise, you can always make sure that you email them directly um, over to me. I'll make sure that they get to um, Dr. Bascom. Um, it looks like we have a question. Um, we'll be able to get copies of the previous PowerPoints. Absolutely, Michael. If you would like copies of the previous PowerPoints, please send me an email. Um, again, I can back up here back to my email. It's listed on the bullet point right there for jmontgomerysemhealth.org. If you send an email over to me with the request, I will make sure that you do get any of the previous PowerPoints as well. And then um, we have another question from Elizabeth. Um, how to get EMDR rec recordings? Oh, okay, yes, so what I can do, so uh, I have them recorded and they're available on my Dropbox, so I can email them, um, I can send them um, to, to you and you can distribute them, um, or if people wanna just personally message me, um, you can pass their, their email along to me and I can send them. Okay, wonderful. So yeah, Elizabeth, if you would like those, just go ahead and put in a request and we can make sure that those get over to you um, as soon as we can. Does anybody else have any other questions? Uh, not that I can see. All right, so I'm going to go ahead. If you've got my email, I'm going to pop up that code for activity code for EADS one more time for everyone. If you have that written down um, at this point, we have concluded our session. So if you are absolutely free to go, if you are welcome to. Um, if you have, again, any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. And we hope you have a wonderful day today. And we appreciate you attending. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.